Hello, and welcome to Rev. Collins' Reflections and Wingham United Church. This service is being prepared for February 6th, 2022. I will be away for a spiritual development or continuing education uh, event uh, from Monday, February the 7th until Thursday the 10th. Uh, however, there will still be worship video services available for uh, both the 6th and the 13th, and I will host Sunday Zoom gatherings on both those Sundays as well. So I look forward to seeing you all. Uh, both Wingham and Bluebell United Churches will remain closed in-person worship for the month of February due to the continued high risk of COVID-19. There are, however, signs of hope in the numbers in the reports, and so we do hope to be back to in-person worship for the month of March. Our call to worship today is, uh, shall we say, inspired by the words of Psalm 138, verses 1 to 5. With my whole heart, I give thanks to God. I bow down toward God's holy temple and give thanks for the Lord's steadfast love and faithfulness. When I call upon the Spirit, my soul is strengthened. Come, join me to sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is God's glory. We light our Christ candle once again as a visible reminder of the presence of Christ among us. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Almighty God, with just a thought, you created everything we know. Yet we act with such foolish pride, demanding our own way, insisting upon our own comfort and happiness at the expense of others. The depth of your patience and grace astounds us when we pause to consider our actions and your faithfulness. Who are we that you should hear our prayers? Yet we are assured that your spirit is with us, moving among us, leading, guiding, and inspiring us to do better, to be better. Help us learn to listen to your still, small voice and follow where it would lead us. These blessings we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who walked among us so that we could learn of them, and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our opening hymn this week is number 315, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
Welcome back to Brother Bear's study once again. Um, this week's scripture readings from Isaiah, uh, 1 Corinthians, and Luke all have a, a very important connection, a common theme that runs through them. Uh, but I'd like to take each of these readings one at a time, exploring each one on its own before kind of tying them all together. Uh, first, of course, let's seek the Spirit's guidance in our study and interpretation of these ancient bits of wisdom. Let's pray. Holy God, you are the source of wisdom to whom we look for guidance as we live the lives you've given us. You're also the source of wonder as we contemplate things beyond our comprehension. As we encounter your word for us this week, may we be open to your teaching and may we live better tomorrow because of it. May the words of my mouth and the contemplations of all our hearts be guided and inspired by you, O Lord, our strength and our hope. Well, let's begin with Isaiah, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. <clears throat> In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots of the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. When I was discerning my call to ministry, and as I worked my way through the education and qualification process that followed, uh, I was regularly interviewed by student and education committees, uh, whose job it was to help me determine if this vocation was truly a divine calling, and if I was up to the challenge that lay ahead. Now perhaps because of this, I, I really appreciate the various call stories that we find in Scripture. Uh, what's particularly interesting to me is how often the person is reluctant or resistant to the call. Uh, Moses didn't think he spoke well enough. Jeremiah thought he was too young and no one would pay attention to him. Uh, here, Isaiah feels he's unworthy of having his vision of God because he's a man of unclean lips. Now this one has special significance for me, for I too am a man of unclean lips, though not in the same way Isaiah meant uh, as most of you know by now, in my former career, I worked as a mechanic. Uh, and mechanics are often seen as being a little rough around the edges, using rough language more than they ought. And I fit that stereotype better than most. Uh, bad language became a very bad habit, especially when things were not going all that well. Um, and, and I still slip <laughs> once in a while. Uh, my own weakness aside, though, I don't think that is what Isaiah was meaning when he spoke of having unclean lips. Israel had turned from God and had been lured into worshipping the false gods and idols of their pagan neighbors. Uh, peer pressure, I suppose. Uh, this prayer and worship are what made Isaiah's lips unclean, as well as those of his fellow countrymen. Isaiah fears that because he, that he is Isaiah fears because he's unworthy of this encounter with the one true God, it is likely his end. Uh, on the contrary, however, one might suggest that this is actually his true beginning. When the angel touches his lips with the burning coal, it's a sign that his past transgressions are forgiven. His lips are now clean and perhaps even consecrated. It's a visible sign of invisible grace, which is how St. Augustine described the sacraments. 
with his guilt departed and his sin blotted out, God's grace has made Isaiah worthy of whatever the Lord has uh, tasked the Lord has for him. So when God asks, whom shall I send? Isaiah readily responds, here I am, send me. And once again, I relate to this story to my own call. Uh, I too was reluctant and resistant, but not for the same reasons. Uh, rather than doubting my worthiness, I feared the cost, both in terms of finances, but more importantly in terms of lifestyle. I, I wasn't eager in my mid-40s to go back to school for a degree, wasn't even sure I was capable of it. Uh, nor was I anxious to give up a, a, a very secure job and submit myself to the uh, humbling experience of regular interviews, oversight, and evaluation by others. Um, fortunately, I, I had others <laughs> to question my suitability and worthiness along the way. Now, over the past few weeks, <clears throat> we've been taking a close look at Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. Last week, Paul dealt with the disunity in the church over the evaluation of particular spiritual gifts. This week, Paul must deal with a very different subject and one of tremendous importance to the Christian church now as it was then. So let's read now um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved. If you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you've come to believe in vain. For I handed it on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Kepha, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles." unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. <clears throat> the big issue for Paul in this portion of his letter is the assurance of Christ's death and resurrection. Some in the church had begun to question this most vital truth. What better way to provide proof than with a list of eyewitnesses? Uh, first there was Kepha, whom we know better as Peter. Uh, then to the twelve disciples. And then to over 500 men and women all at one time most of whom are still alive to share their story. Uh, th then there was James and the apostles, and finally, Paul himself. And this is where our two stories connect. Like Isaiah, Paul did not believe himself worthy of this great blessing. Who was he, after all he had done, to persecute Jesus' followers, to have his own personal encounter with the risen Christ? Also, like Isaiah, he's so moved by the grace of this moment, by his gratitude for this blessing despite his obvious unworthiness, he responds to the call and works much harder to carry out his God-given mission. As he is by writing this letter while sitting in prison for having done so. It doesn't matter who told them this truth. As long as they believe the truth that's been shared with them and respond with humble service, as Paul and Isaiah have done. Finally, let's turn to our gospel lesson for this Sunday. And this week we look at Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. 
The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their nets to shore, they left everything and followed him. Now obviously this is very early in Jesus' ministry, but already he's gaining a reputation as someone who spoke with authority about heavenly things. He draws a huge crowd, and as they press in around him, all hoping for a better view or to hear his words more clearly, he's forced to borrow a boat and preach from offshore as the people spread out along the beach. Between his teaching and the miraculous catch of fish that almost sinks the boat he's riding in, Jesus convinces Simon, also known as Peter, that he is the real deal. And Peter, like Paul and Isaiah and James and John, know he's not worthy of the blessing which has just been bestowed upon him. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Again, as those we've already spoken of, out of gratitude, he pledges to serve Christ and go from catching fish to catching people for God. So we have three people who have perhaps contributed more to our faith than anyone else outside of Jesus himself. And yet every one of them felt worthy, unworthy of the, the call or of the task set before them. Contrast that to the self-entitled attitude so prevalent in our world today, evidenced most recently by the insurrection taking place in Ottawa by people who think they're comfort or convenience is paramount to public health and safety. In truth, none of us are worthy of the blessings we've received. As people of faith, we are called to do as Isaiah and Paul and Peter and Jeremiah and Moses and James and John and Thomas and so many others and live lives of humble service to God by living lives of humble service to others. C.S. Lewis, among others, wrote that the greatest of all sins is pride, largely because pride causes so many other sinful thoughts and actions. Yet, by God's grace and infinite patience, we are called to serve, to put the needs of others ahead of our own selfish desires, to show God's love and compassion to everyone we meet, and especially those most in need who have little or nothing to offer us in return. That is is what it means to be a Christian. And we are made worthy of this call by grace alone. Among the effects of this pandemic is the revelation of the true character of so many people in the world around us. We've seen those who step up, who sacrifice, who put the needs of others ahead of their own wants and desires and seek to help us all get through this together. And there are those who selfishly protest minor inconveniences, rant and rave about their personal rights and freedoms, and risk the health, safety, and the very lives of others, rather than offer any real contribution of anything of their own. One faction seems to get most of the attention in the news. The other receives the applause of heaven. Let's pray. Gracious God, who among us is worthy of your love? And yet your word assures us that we are loved completely, unconditionally, and selflessly as only you know how to love. 
in gratitude for this divine blessing. May we each find our way to show our love for you through our humble service to the world we live in. As we repent of our past unworthiness, we give thanks for the assurance that we are forgiven and ordained to carry out our missions as disciples of Christ, guided by your Holy Spirit. We pray for those who show us the way through our, their own sacrifice in the service of others and of us. Healthcare workers and their support staff who are strained to their limits and beyond. Teachers struggling to adapt to unfamiliar and ever-changing ways of educating our children. Truck drivers who continue to do their job to stock store shelves, fill fuel tanks, provide health care resources, and all the other needs and desires upon which we depend. Business owners, store clerks, clerks, waiters and waitresses, those working the assembly lines to create the things we need, and everyone involved in moving those items from factory to homes. Farmers who continue to feed the world as they always have through every crisis and challenge. And everyone else who, in their own way, and according to their own gifts, find a way to make the world around them a little easier, a little brighter, a little safer, a little less lonely, through their sacrifice and humble service. We pray, O oh Lord, for an end to this pandemic, but we pray that the lessons we've learned through it will remain so that our world may be made better for all. We pray for renewed health for those who are ill from COVID-19 or any illness. We pray that people whose treatments have been postponed because of the strain and overwork placed in our health care system may get the care they need in timely fashion. We pray for those lost and miserable souls who are so wrapped up in themselves that they cannot see the harm they do to themselves and others when they so stubbornly refuse to be part of the solution rather than compounding the problems we must all live with. May they find enlightenment. We pray for our leaders who have come to know that there is nothing they can do that will not be scrutinized, criticized, and condemned by people who, know for them, who neither know for themselves the right answers nor share in the responsibility to contribute to a solution. There are many others for whom we would and should pray, O oh Lord, but the list overwhelms our thoughts and our emotions. In these next few moments, let each of us offer our specific prayers of care and concern, but also of gratitude and commitment to your service as we strive to make the world a greater reflection of your kingdom. We could pray for days, O oh Lord, about the things we would like to change in the world around us, knowing that there are others praying for just the opposite. We struggle to see past our own desires or opinions and lack the wisdom and vision to know what's best for all. That wisdom belongs to you alone. So we end this prayer with the familiar words Jesus taught us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This we humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Our closing hymn today is an old favorite once again. Number 560 from Voices United. O Master, let me walk with thee.
Christ invites us to cast our nets and gather in the abundance and generosity of God, but also to share what we receive with others. Through our offerings to our communities of faith, we place our trust in the one who called us to follow him and become fishers of people. For the tithes and offerings we have received, let's pray. Dear God, our nets are full of your blessings. We pray that these gifts we bring will be used to fill the nets of your children in this congregation, in our community, and throughout the world. Guide us in their use so that we might be a blessing to others in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you enter the world this week, once again I urge you to remember the words of the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Seek to be a blessing to everyone you meet. Brighten someone's day every chance you can. And take time to enjoy the beauty of God's creation all around you. And in these you will find the peace and the presence of God. We extinguish our Christ candle now so that we may carry the light of Christ with us into the world beyond our doors. May you see Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the light of Christ in you. May the love of God, the wisdom of Christ Jesus, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit lead and inspire you throughout the days ahead. Amen.